from the implicit function theorem, we've seen that uh, if we're looking for a branch of solutions as we change a control parameter, mu, then as long as the determinant of the Jacobian is not zero, meaning as long as there's no zero eigenvalue of the Jacobian, we can continue that branch continuously and uniquely. So the question now to answer, ask is what happens if the determinant of L is not zero, is not non-zero, meaning if it goes to zero, if there's a zero eigenvalue. So that's what we want to look at. We'll find out that a, then we get a bifurcation, but we can get different kind of bifurcations. And so to see what can happen, we'll look at that in some more detail. And for that, let's look actually at a simple one-dimensional system. So again, we have our good old x dot equals f of x and mu. And let's assume we have a fixed point. Now for simplicity, let's assume that fixed point is at um, x naught equals zero. And we pick also mu naught equals zero. We can just shift the coordinates to do that. And so therefore to see what happens now in the vicinity of that uh, parameter value zero, we expand our Taylor using Taylor again. So if f of x and mu is equal to f of zero and zero plus df by dx times x plus df by d mu times mu. And now we have to take actually a bunch of other terms still, which makes this um, a little bit more cumbersome. But um, we'll, we'll manage. So I go all the way in the second order in x and mu, and um, then the other terms will neglect. Will neglect. Good. So as before, we'd like to simply solve for x as a function of mu. And let's see whether we can do that and under what conditions. So let's see, what do we know? Uh, well, we said that zero, zero is a fixed point. So this term here is actually zero. We can ignore it. We also wanted to say, assume that we are at a point where the implicit function theorem is not, uh, does not apply. So that means df by dx is zero, and so we can throw that term away. Well, but now we have um, a whole bunch of other terms and it's not clear. None of them has to be zero. There's no information that we have. What we do have, however, is the assumption that we, we are doing a local analysis, meaning mu is actually small as is x. But what we don't know is how x and mu are related. Is x large compared to mu, small compared to mu? We do not know. Well, what can we say? Well, let's compare terms. So we know that mu is small. That means if you, for instance, compare now the term mu squared, mu squared with mu, then clearly mu squared has to be small compared to mu. So we can uh, throw that term away. Similarly, uh, we have the x is small compared to, well, let's see, that may not work so well. Uh, can we, what can we say about this term? x is small compared to mu. No, we do not know that. We only know x is small, but that is enough to say that this guy must be small compared to this guy because it's an extra factor of x. So we can also throw this away. Well, now we only have two terms. Uh, we, we need two terms to solve for something. Okay, so we're fine. Good, let's solve for it. Doing that, we solve for x. We get actually now x squared equals minus df by d mu times mu divided by one half d2f by dx squared. Um, so what we got is now a nonlinear equation for x. Compare that with what we had before, when the implicit function theorem applied, we had simply that x is linear and mu, and we essentially had this branch of solutions. Remember, we just had um, you know, a branch of solutions going through this uh, through this fixed point and 
for small mu essentially x was proportional to mu. But now we have a nonlinear equation, and the nonlinear equation actually has two solutions. Maybe I should have made it more explicit. Um, by writing x12 is equal to plus minus the square root of minus, well, df by d mu, d2f by dx squared, one half times mu. And so we see that we have two solutions. But only if the uh, term inside the square root is actually positive. So let me sort of say on one side of mu equals zero, right? Depending on uh, the df by the mu and the df by the x squared, uh, depending on the sign of that, the two solutions show up for positive or negative mu. So we have two solutions or none. Maybe wait, let's maybe say that or none. So the total number of solutions changes from zero to two, either by increasing or decreasing mu. And the other thing we see is that the change in mu of x is of course not smooth because the square root is not a smooth function. It has a singularity at x equals zero. I mean, at the uh, radicand equals zero. Okay, so that's what happens when the implicit function theorem doesn't hold. We have two solutions. We'd like to know their stability. So we need to go back and actually go back to our original equation and essentially just plug in our expansion for f in that equation. And then we see what is stable and what is not stable. So let's do that. So we get, um, so we just put in back dynamics. And so we get x dot is equal to f. Um, so we have a term in mu and we have a term in x squared. So let's maybe make life a little bit simpler. Just say this is a times mu plus one half b times x squared, where a and b are these coefficients. a is this coefficient and b is this derivative. Okay. So the behavior of this equation depends on, essentially on the sign of a and b. We see that in terms of uh, the, the fixed points already, and then also the stability. So let's summarize the results that we get here in a bifurcation diagram. And um, which means we essentially what we do is we plot as a function of mu, all the fixed points. Um, so for any given value of mu, um, I have therefore, if you want, a phase line. So say for this mu, let's say this was mu equals zero. So that's where actually the bifurcation occurs. Um, we have a phase line, if you want. And on that phase line, we have the dynamics and fixed points and stuff like that. And we put all these phase lines next to each other. And so that's how we get the whole bifurcation diagram. Um, let me undo this uh, blue stuff again, because it's a little bit in the way. Um, so uh, what do we have? We have, um, depending on the sign of A and B, Let's say we have A is positive and B is negative, just to pick a case. So if A is positive, A is positive, B is negative, then what do we have? Then we have, um, so X12 is equal to the square root of minus A over 2B times mu. And in this case, A over B is negative. So we have a solution if mu is positive. So let me put mu equals zero here. And so we have a solution and mu is positive. So we have a parabolic shape here for the square root. And um, so these are the fixed points. And I'd like to also denote stability here. So let's see how we can do that. Um, I can everywhere on, on for, you know, as I said, for each value of mu, we have a face line. And so on that face line, we can indicate the flows. I'm going to put arrows on, on this plane here. 
And uh, how do I do that most efficiently? Well, let's say if A is, if mu is negative, then we are on, on the left side of this uh, nose, so to speak. If mu is negative, then the first term here, this term is negative. And the second term is also negative because it's E is negative. So X dot is negative. So for negative mu, we have the flow downward. And we know, and this is sort of a general way to, to construct us bifurcation diagrams, we know that X dot vanishes exactly on that, by, on that uh, branch of solutions, right? This is exactly the, the line of fixed points. This is when this right-hand side vanishes. So that's when X dot changes sign, and that's when the arrows change their direction. So I know that the arrows have to go like this and like that, and inside they have to go like that. And so now we see what, uh, which branches are stable or unstable. Um, we see the upper branch here is stable because the flow is towards it, whereas the lower part here is unstable. Um, and so I, I dash it. So that's one bifurcation a diagram we get for A and bigger than zero and B uh, smaller than zero. Just for the fun of it, let's also look at the case A is bigger than zero, but B also positive. Uh, then <clears throat> if I put axis there again, and again, let's say zero is here. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the solution only exists if um, a mu is negative. And so the parabola sits like this. And uh, in terms of stability, the same procedure, let's do that, this procedure here. Uh, if mu is positive, if mu is positive, then the first term is positive. Um, the second term is positive, so we have a flow like this. And so we have the flow like that. And we have, in terms of stability, we have this branch being stable and this branch being unstable. Okay. Um, so qualitatively, there are two more diagrams. If you flip the sign of A and B now, then the fixed point lines don't change, but the stability changes around. So there are four cases, uh, but I'm not going to try the other ones. They're straightforward to get from here. Okay, good. So what kind of general things have we learned from this? Um, first, we have derived an equation. Uh, let, let's actually, let's box this equation in terms of its quality, uh, its shape, so to speak, or the form of this equation. Because it turns out this equation is, um, the, as man says, the normal form for any saddle node bifurcation. Uh, this is what you should expect even more complicated systems even in higher dimensions we'll get there with, with, with time even in higher dimensions the saddle bifurcation would be described by this kind of equation so that's the normal form for a uh, saddle node bifurcation um what else is there to be said? Um, we note that the, if you go along the solution branch, the solution changes stability at the nose, which is the bifurcation point, right? And that is consistent again, of course, with what we had from the implicit function theorem, where we said the number of solutions can only change if the determinant is zero, which means if an eigenvalue goes through zero, meaning if the stability of a solution changes. And that's what's happening exactly here. The stability of that solution changes as you go around that nose. Um, there's also another statement uh, we should make, which is very important. Um, let's go back to the equation that we, the derivation, what we did. We arrived at this result by assuming only that we are at a bifurcation, uh, we have a fixed point, and we are at a bifurcation point. We've not assumed anything else. So therefore, if you have a general system and you find yourself 
you know, this could be a very complicated system. We'll find out, you know, that these, these things carry over for high dimensional systems and even PDEs. But, you know, you find yourself at a bifurcation point. You, somehow you find that out. We'll find that out later. Then what you should expect, if you know nothing else, if there's nothing special happening, you should expect the saddle node bifurcation. So in that sense, the saddle node bifurcation is generic in the sense that if there's a bifurcation, that would be the bifurcation that you sh should expect unless something special happens. So let me just write that down because it's reasonably important. Is, let me say sort of the generic bifurcation. There are other bifurcations, but you have to tune parameters to get those. So they're more special. Uh, finally, um, there's um, just a word. Why is it called a saddle node bifurcation? Uh, there is no saddle to be seen. We're just in 1D, right? There's no saddle in 1D. So the, the, way, the reason it's called a saddle node bifurcation is if in the general case, imagine you're in the face plane, for instance. Well, let's first draw our face line, but let's draw it sort of in, in this way. And so we have the transition from a stable fixed point and an unstable fixed point. That's what we have here, right? A stable fixed point and an unstable fixed point. So I just draw the face line for this value of the parameter. And um, we go then to the situation where both of these uh, uh, fixed points have disappeared. That's on this side. So on the flow here on that face line, as we indicated, the flow is um, like this and like this. So strictly speaking, the stable fixed point is like a, is a, a, sor a sink and the unstable is a source if you want. However, if you now imagine you're in two dimensions in the face plane or maybe even higher dimensions, then uh, you also have to consider what happens in the other directions. And there um, you can have the flow. You know, you assume that this is actually um, the stable this face line is stable with respect to the other directions, so that it would be attractive. And um, so it would be attractive in this direction. So let me draw that actually, if this thing machine is cooperating. Um, so, right. so, so there's all other directions also. And we assume that this whole face line is attractive in the other direction. So the flow is actually towards that face line. And now you see that we have indeed a saddle and a node and the bifurcation that occurs is involves a saddle and a node and they annihilate each other as in after the bifurcation has occurred the flow is simply like that you have a you have the flow towards the face line but on that face line itself the flow is purely to the right there's no fixed point left okay so that's what happens if you have a bifurcation and there's nothing else happening. And so you should expect a saddle node bifurcation, and that would be a very general phenomenon. There's a whole bunch of examples one could think of, and uh, but I won't get, go into that right now. Uh, next time, we'll look at what happens when there are some special situations and see how then we don't get a saddle node bifurcation, but other bifurcations.